In this presentation, I'm going to show you what our apostolic lineage is in the Home Temple Synod. The term Episcopi Vagantes or Episcopus uh, Vagante uh, literally means something like wandering or traveling bishop. Uh, we are Episcopi Vagantes, uh, those of us who are consecrated as bishops, and our, our lineage is rooted in historic apostolic succession. These are people that I call apostles of the new spirituality, which uh, has been reformed in order to uh, be illuminated by the actual historical teachings of the Master Yeshua, Jesus. So the original Episcopi Vagantes were apostles who traveled widely. Uh, Peter in Judea and Asia Minor in Rome and disciple Mark in Rome and Egypt. Philip was uh, uh, sent as a disciple to Ethiopia, Thomas to India, and so on. Uh, there are many unnamed apostolic teachers on the earliest period. Paul's uh, hearers or teachers in Damascus, for example, uh, and those that he studied with when he went into the Judean desert. Uh, in the Pauline churches, the Gentile churches, there were wandering male and female disciples and apostles who went from congregation to congregation, teaching and speaking. Paul claimed to be an apostle, even though he had not uh, studied with Yeshua, and uh, he was not in the line of succession of the apostles. So there is no apostolic lineage from Paul. The apostolic lineages come from the actual disciples or apostles, Peter, and so on. The apocryphal acts of John and others from the period give a kind of view of what the Episcopi Vagantes were like. They were uh, traveling people who went from synagogue to synagogue and later on from a Gentile congregation to congregation. Uh, and they were called the sometimes prophets and they uh, transmitted their knowledge and they also channeled knowledge and they also uh, uh, gave inspirational speeches that were inspired at the time and the place in the moment. In Rome, uh, geographically settled churches uh, competed for supremacy and we have a letter, a letter of Clement of Rome, who settles the issue. The issue was, will congregations vote to decide who will be an apostolic successor, or will the apostles themselves choose their successors? And Clement ruled, and uh, the convention became, that uh, there was a, the supremacy would be uh, given to apostolic succession from apostle to apostle and that was the way it was established in the first century. The kind of Christianity that existed before the time of the Council of Nicaea uh, which was convened by the churches uh, at the instigation of uh, the new Byzantine Emperor uh, Constantine uh, is called pre-Nicene Christianity and we have many stories and legends from that time for example of the apostle peter being crucified upside down and things like that uh, the tomb of saint thomas the apostle uh, is still being maintained in india uh, many people doubt the uh, historicity of that of this tomb but it's interesting that on the tomb the uh, the old form of Hindi that is written on the tomb was a form that had vanished by the end of the second century. So it's probably very, very early that this tomb existed and it's possibly evidence of the uh, mission of St. Thomas. The Greek Orthodox churches uh, eventually developed out of the Gentile churches that uh, Paul had established, but also the churches of the East probably developed out of Jewish 
Christian congregations that had been established by original apostles. One of the early legends is of the um, of a of a handkerchief or a scarf that had received the impression of the face of Jesus, uh, which people now think is probably uh, a precursor of the legends of the Mandelian, uh, which has become what we call the Shroud of Turin. So let's talk about apostolic succession. Uh, in the fourth century, St. Augustine of Hippo established what the rules and conventions were as they were being practiced, and those rules and conventions have, uh, have been followed ever since in the Western churches and the Roman church. One is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, the order of Melchizedek is, uh, Melchizedek was the, the king of righteousness, the person who, uh, in, in the stories of the, uh, uh, of the Old Testament, who uh, served a sacred meal of bread and wine to uh, Abraham and uh, is, was considered to be a mystic figure that represented the true priesthood uh, that God had established on earth. And so this term, one is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, is established because the Christian priesthood was considered to be this uh, priesthood that was the eternal priesthood of God. The rules of apostolic succession uh, were as follows. The, the consecration of a bishop must be done in the context of the Eucharist or the Holy Communion liturgy. There must be an actual laying on of hands by the consecrating bishop. And the consecrating bishop provides the lineage for the next bishop. The consecrator must be a validly consecrated bishop and the consecrator's intention must be to consecrate a bishop. In other words, he's not coerced or uh, threatened by death if he doesn't uh, go ahead and perform this consecration. And these are the rules that basically govern the apostolic succession. Even though uh, in Roman Christianity, uh, by the 11th, 12th century, it was determined that there must be three bishops present for a consecration to take place. It was traced only through the consecrator, the one bishop. Uh, the three, the other two bishops were there as a check and balance uh, so that there wouldn't be heretics that were consecrated as bishops. Uh, but the, the, from the very beginning, it was not that way. It didn't require three bishops uh, to consecrate a new bishop. It was always just one bishop consecrated another. There were ancient traditions that were associated with the consecration, like the exsufflation, which is the uh, breathing onto the uh, crown of the head by the consecrating bishop uh, in imitation of Yeshua's uh, transmission of the Holy Spirit as is described in the Gospel of John. We uh, don't know exactly what the initiations were that Yeshua performed. They're lost, but they were called initiation into the mysteries of the Ratzim, Hamelkut HaShemayim, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is the way it's translated, but literally of the sovereignty of the heavens, plural. Uh, in THG require uh, uh, that um, that bishops have not only studied for the episcopate through special studies that we provide uh, once they've been nominated uh, and approved, but we require that they've gone through the first order of the Temple of the Holy Grail so that they have acquired some serious uh, uh, or developed some, some serious powers of uh, healing and other things that have to do with uh, elemental uh, yogic tantric control. And we require that they study the Kabbalistic Aramaic teachings of Yeshua, uh, which are not only the uh, public teachings, but the inner uh, 
teachings that Yeshua transmitted to his disciples that are found, most of them, uh, outside of the New Testament canon in, in the Gospel of Thomas and other places. The Roman and Orthodox churches and, and, the, and Greek Orthodoxy does not separate from Roman Catholicism until many centuries after the uh, Council of Nicaea, but they, they continued as a separate church and various, uh, various denominations of a separate church, the Greek Orthodox. And the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox churches held uh, the apostolic succession exclusively until the uh, 20th century with a couple of exceptions. There were secret societies, there were Coptic and other isolated churches. The Vatican made uh, uh, deals with third world churches with valid apostolic succession so that they would become unit churches. And uh, although they would have to profess an allegiance to the Pope, they would, con they would continue with all their own traditions and their uh, liturgies and so on. The Church of England and the Swedish Lutheran Church have valid apostolic succession. They are Protestant churches, but they uh, came into being in such a way that they uh, had established within them uh, valid apostolic succession. Now the same conventions apply to ordination as a deacon or priest in the apostolic succession. Each of these offices may exercise apostolic authority only under the oversight of a bishop and as an extension of that bishop's authority as a successor of the apostles. Apostolic succession is not able to be transmitted by priests or by deacons, but they serve under it and they are, uh, so to speak, an arm. They are licensed by a bishop to operate. The bishop may choose to revoke the license of a deacon or priest to operate, in which case the ordination is still valid. He's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, but the deacon or priest no longer has apostolic authority for sacramental or other work. All deacons and priests must operate under the authority of one bishop but may transfer to another bishop's jurisdiction with the letters demissary from the ordaining bishop. And deacons and priests do not have the authority to ordain others, but they may teach, heal, offer the sacraments, and operate other ministries. Let's take a look at the Eastern Orthodox churches. The split from the Western churches gradually between the 4th and 9th centuries. The Byzantine Church of the whole Holy Roman Empire of Constantine uh, eventually developed its own official state churches and some others that developed farther along in the east. These churches follow different conventions in apostolic succession, but these are later Orthodox Church conventions. They are not the original ones. For example, bishops cannot marry. Uh, that's been upheld in the uh, Roman Catholic Church that no ordained person can be married, but uh, that's not true in the Anglican or the, Sw or the Swedish Lutheran or some other kinds of denominations. In the Eastern Orthodox Churches, the validity of ordination or consecration depends upon the orthodoxy of dogma and theology. In other words, if the bishop... Uh, uh, no longer espouses or wanders from the uh, fixed teachings of the Orthodox Church, and that's all they really study in, in theological seminary. They don't do biblical criticism. They don't do history of liturgy. They basically study third century, fourth century Greek uh, theology, and if they wander from that theology, if they start teaching something else, then they can be basically dismissed or unfrocked. Uh, therefore, there's no possibility of change because in the attempt to make it impossible for there to be heresy in the Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, they also made it impossible for there to be any change or transformation. 
they do not recognize the validity of the Western Apostolic Succession uh, from the Pope to all the Vagates. So don't expect yourself to be recognized as validly ordained or consecrated by an Eastern Orthodox uh, authority. They claim <clears throat> exclusively the apostolic succession and no one else can claim it in their view. Uh, except perhaps the mysterious Johannite church, which we might discuss a bit later. Now, I have written a book uh, called The Episcopi Vagantes um, that you are uh, probably expected to read, uh, but I give you copies online or, or PDF files or whatever. And it discusses how it was that the apostolic succession, the valid apostolic succession, came out of the Roman Catholic Church in the West and eventually out of the East and uh, was uh, delivered over to other uh, kinds of uh, churches like the liberal Catholic Church and to the various independent bishops. Uh, I call it the stolen blessing. In the late uh, 19th century, Bishop Arnold Harris Matthew and the old Catholic bishops of Utrecht uh, came into being through the valid consecration of uh, Matthew. He was a troubled man who swung back and forth between old Catholic Anglican and Roman Catholicism views of Christianity but he was very respected. Uh, there are many books about what happened here. This one called Arnold uh, Harris Matthew and the Old Catholic Movement in England, uh, 1908 to 52 by John Kersey is, is one good book with a lot of good pictures. But he was basically consecrated as a bishop by the Utrecht uh, the, the old but the Dutch Catholic bishops who were valid Roman Catholic bishops uh, and, um, and was able to carry apostolic succession out of the Roman Catholic Church and pass it on to others. Uh, this is a, a one picture of his consecration. This is a picture of Harris. Through Harris, uh, people were consecrated that led to the establishment of the liberal Catholic Church. There was a Bishop Willoughby who carried on the succession from Harris. He was a deposed Anglican accused of homosexuality. This was not true, and it was a false accusation because he was uh, extremely uh, uh, controversial because of his views. Matthew carefully reviewed the whole situation then decided he was innocent and he consecrated him. Uh, under pressure he later excommunicated Willoughby which was who was the first modern Episcopus Vagans. Uh, Willoughby sympathized with theosophical movement views and he consecrated bishops Wedgwood and Leadbeater to create the liberal Catholic Church. Leadbeater was a famous occultist and did most of his work in Australia. He uh, did not accept the idea that women could be priests and operate sacramentally and the liberal Catholic Church still maintains that view uh, but it's not a valid view. There's a lot of things but the biggest thing that's wrong with the liberal Catholic Church today probably is adherence to Leadbeater's views. Uh, it never ordained one that it still doesn't, but there's some very interesting things that I have found. Annie Besant, uh, who is the person who uh, had taken Krishnamurti as a young boy into her keeping, brought him to America, and decided that he was going to be the new avatar uh, and established uh, things in Ojai and other places in the United States 
interestingly is shown in a photograph that I got through Bishop Spruitt. Um, and she seems in the picture to be uh, part of the priestly consecration of the elements. This is Leadbeater's Australian students. Uh, he has, he in, in the middle. This is uh, where the bishops that passed on the consecration uh, from, from Matthew Arnold Harris and brought it into uh, the uh, liberal Catholic church. This is a picture here of Leadbeater on the right. This is a picture of Annie Besant uh, participating in a, in, at, the, at the altar uh, in a mass of the liberal Catholic Church. And uh, she may have been secretly and clandestinely ordained as a priest, possibly a bishop. Well, the Leadbeater's impact was, was immense in, in theosophy. Annie Besant uh, was the one who had uh, taken over uh, raising the new avatar, Krishnamurti. And uh, she was uh, very involved with Charles Leadbeater. Uh, Leadbeater wrote a book called The Science of the Sacraments in which he talks about all the esoteric aspects of the mass and explains his theory about why women cannot uh, uh, work sacramentally and so on. This book is still influential uh, all over the world. And he wrote many other kinds of books that uh, uh, have been very influential. Um, the one that he wrote with Annie Besant was called Occult Chemistry. And uh, there were many other books. And these determined theosophical thought in the liberal Catholic Church for a long period of time. Now, the liberal Catholic Church expanded in the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century to Hollywood and California and became a very, uh, received a great deal of money and support from Hollywood and uh, people who were wealthy uh, on the west coast of California and places like that. And they expanded then all over the entire world with their main center at Adyar in India. Leadbeater's books on liturgy and mass attempted to reestablish the ancient Christian mysteries, but uh, the liberal Catholic Church did not ordain women. They focused entirely on Leadbeater's occultism. And by the last quarter of the 20th century, they started losing their best people. Uh, I finally agreed to independently consecrate as independent bishops five different priests over a period of several years that uh, withdrew from the liberal Catholic Church and became independent, some of whom are still living. Another way that valid apostolic lineage came into the independent uh, apostolic movement uh, was through Joseph René Villat. Now, I'm showing you, by the way, a link to Bishop Londano's flash, flash presentation on home temple lineages. Uh, it's at this link that we show here. It's uh, found at hometemple.org in the section about apostolic lineage, or you can simply type uh, slash APSUC slash start dot HTML. It's a flash presentation, so you'll have to enable flash, but your computer will show you how to do it. Now, this is called the Syrian Malabar succession. In 1882, uh, Bishop Alvarez of the Independent Catholic Church of Goa and Ceylon in India consecrated Vilat as a missionary bishop to uh, come to Canada and uh, the uh, continent over here in order to serve uh, 
the needs of the, the communities over there. Uh, he obtained written permission of Ignatius Peter III, who was Patriarch of Antioch at that time. He made many valid bishops for immigrants in Canada and the U.S. Uh, and created the Polish Catholic succession for immigrants in New York and in Wisconsin. This is a picture of the lat. Uh, he also created the Syrian Gallican succession for French immigrants, which is independent of the French Catholic Church. And he also developed lineages for the American Catholic Church the African Orthodox Church, known as the American African Americans uh, Church on the East Coast. And these were commingled with the Matthew successions through the immigration of old Catholic bishops to America. Now you have to understand that the old Catholic bishops and also various other bishops that were somewhat independent of Rome, but maybe in, this, in communion with Rome, <clears throat> needed people to serve the needs of their ethnic communities in the New World. And they themselves did not wish to travel there, so they made what they call missionary bishops. In other words, uh, each one was made an Episcopus Vagans, a uh, so-called wandering bishop or an independent bishop. And that's how that began the process on this continent. <laughs> This is a good book, uh, again, uh, by John Kersey on the, the Joseph René Villat successions and some aspects of his life and work in succession. Now, Villat had been vilified uh, by competing uh, uh, successions from Rome and uh, the Orthodox churches. Uh, because he was independent and, and basically threatened their opportunities to minister to these congregations. But uh, he was not, uh, things that were said against him were slanderous. They, they tried to uh, deny the validity of his uh, consecration, but it's very well documented. These are pictures of uh, some of his congregations and of uh, Villat and the people that he served uh, and also with other uh, members of other clergy and, or, and Orthodox clergy. So we have René Villat here in the upper picture and I've given you uh, pictures to show him and Mar Timotheos uh, Miramaton, Mar Ivanios, and so on, others, and then Mar Julius Alvarez, who was another uh, uh, wandering bishop, so to speak, missionary bishop. There he is. <clears throat> now, this was a period of Episcopal th synthesis that occurred in North America after these lines of succession were brought over. Uh, in the 19th century, the 1800s, there was established in, uh, by Anglicans the uh, Order of Corporate Reunion, which was an attempt to uh, solve the uh, accusations by the Roman Catholic Church that the Anglican uh, successions were not valid. They were valid, and it's been admitted to be such later in the 19th century and the 20th century uh, by the Catholic Church and um, others, but uh, in the 19th century it wasn't. And so these people clandestinely began to do uh, a special form of consecration uh, that uh, if a person was not, a person who had been consecrated, but if he had, uh, if there was any question about it, then a, the consecration could be performed again by an unquestionable uh, source, uh, a reconsecration. These were called subconditional consecrations in order to uh, dispel any accusations that they weren't valid. Now, today, the Pope only has a few of the totally extant 22 lines of apostolic succession. And a lot of these, uh, all 22 lines are are held in the uh, the home temple 
and they are held, uh, many of them 16 lines, 18 lines, in many other independent uh, uh, apostolic churches. Well, one of the ways that the, uh, the Orthodox uh, successions came into North America and eventually uh, became part of the successions of the independent bishops over here uh, was through Bishop Anthony Aeneid. <clears throat> now, he was made the Orthodox Exarchate for the Americas. That means that he was sent over here to serve the congregations of his ethnic group, but uh, in order to do that, he needed full powers. He could make his own rules. He could uh, do whatever he needed to do in order to make it work over here in the new country, and he wouldn't be bound by any of the rules, including rules like clergy can't marry and things like that. Uh, there also uh, were lines of succession that came through Mar Johannes and Mar Georgius, the patriarch of Elastonbury in England, uh, that had gone back to the 19th century order of corporate reunion and were passed on then to North America through, uh, through bishops in North America. And this was done through the subconditional consecration. By 1956, Georges and Johannes had accumulated all 16 known lines of succession. Now, Bishop Wadley, who is a co-consecrator of Bishop Spruitt, who is my consecrator, visited London uh, to, in, with Mar Johannes and Mar Georges to receive the rest of the Western succession, which he did. Now, Bishop Wadley was pretty conservative, and in his visit in 1957 uh, to, to synthesize European and American successions, he was appalled by the fact that there were women in the sanctuary in England, which he considered to be scandalous. He took a photo of it to prove that some people were allowing women in, to be in the sanctuary. These are the bishops that Wadley uh, visited. Now, getting back to Bishop Anthony and Need, we have to see how it was that he could create valid Orthodox successions. Because remember, uh, Orthodoxy did not uh, accept people to be bishops if they were not Orthodox in their theology and practice. But remember also that Anthony Aeneid was made, made an ex archate. That means he could make his own rules. So he came over to minister to the Syrian Melkite immigrant congregations. And he was made a missionary bishop he, and, and he reincorporated the church in the US. And that became a separate Orthodox ex archate in cooperation with the American independent bishops. It was not subject to the old world orthodoxy, but still valid and recognized by them. Uh, and that was the Syrian Melkite Uniate Church in communion with Rome. That followed the Augustinian rules of succession. Now Bishop Wadley of the American Catholic Church and Bishop Verestek of the Old Catholic or Matthew successions met with a need in 1944 and they made what was called the American Concordat. And uh, they created an exarchate with Bishop Aeneid as the exarch. And it was designed to be, and I'm quoting from their documentation, an association of non-papal prelates and federation of independent Catholic churches possessed of valid orders in a confraternity and association of brotherhood whereby an agreement of association shall be established looking toward the ultimate fusion of all independent Catholic churches under one name using an authorized liturgy or liturgies. Now this is before women were ordained in the independent churches. 
men ruled. And the idea was, of course, to create uh, a single powerful church of all these independent uh, churches. And this was towards the end of World War II that this was done. But this has created this uh, uh, American Concordat. Um, Bishop Anthony Aneed, who's sitting in the center here, <clears throat> met with all these other uh, independent clergy, and these, this is one of his congregations, Syrian Melkite congregations. Um, and he was recognized by His Holiness Pius X, uh, and Aneed um, met with him and was recognized by him. So the lineages of this exarchate <clears throat> were the Roman, which are the Old Catholic uh, as well, and the Antiochene and the Byzantine, which are the Orthodox. So as you take a look at this chart, you can see how that eventually led to the uh, meeting of Wadley and Anid and Verostak, and how they then combined their orders together. Now, Bishop Spruitt, who was my consecrator, uh, was consecrated uh, by Charles Hampton, who was a liberal Catholic bishop who consecrated Spruitt. He was consecrated by Cooper, who was consecrated by Wadley, who had received lines from Georges and the Order of Corporate Reunion, and from Aneed, the Eastern Orthodox. Now we have Western and Eastern uh, successions united. So Spruit had all extant Western and Eastern apostolic lineages known at that time, which were 16, I believe. Here's a picture of Bishop Charles Hampton being enthroned, and he was the consecrator of Spruit. Uh, Bishop Woolsey and, uh, created what we call the Anglo-Canadian successions, Here's a complete list of the successions obtained by Archbishop Woolsey from Mar Georges and Mar Johannes of the English Corporate Union. Uh, and in 1956, these were subconditionally validated uh, with Bishop Wadley, who in the same year transmitted them to Spruit, who consecrated Kaiser. Now, if you get a hold of my book called The Wandering Bishops, all these documents are found replicated there. And as, as, as they were passed on to Spruit, my consecrator, for further synthesis, and I reproduced the successions of Mar Petrus I, the Bishop of Anbur, India, and that, whose orders have been synthesized by Wadley and were handed down to Kaiser, and so on. Uh, this is more detailed information about this. Now here we tell an interesting story about Bishop Clayfish, who was a journalist and received the validly the Russian Orthodox successions uh, when he was fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution in 1918. And he found himself imprisoned with the uh, Russian Orthodox Patriarch. Archbishop Sergius and other clergy scheduled for summary execution in Harbin, Siberia. So here's, Clayfish is just a journalist. Because he was American, Clayfish would be allowed to leave, but the others would die according to what was planned. And so to preserve the Russian Orthodox succession, Sergius consecrated Clayfish in extremis, that's called the canon of necessity, so that the succession could live on after his uh, murder by the Bolsheviks. But Sergius later escaped and became Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. Clayfish passed on the successions he had received to Bishop Wadley in 1958. So as of 1956, here's what the lines of succession looked like. There was a Syrian Antiochene, the Syrian Malabar, the Syrian Gallican, the Syro-Chaldean, the Chaldean Uniate, the Coptic Orthodox, the Armenian Uniate, the Order of Corporate Reunion, the Old Catholic, the Mariavite, the Non-Juring from England, the Anglican, 
and the Russian Orthodox and the Russian Syrian Orthodox and the Greek Melkite and the liberal Catholic. That's 16 lines of succession. Now, Bishop Spruitt consecrated, was consecrated by bishops in Need, Hampton, and Wadley, and received, as a result of that, 18 lines of succession. And uh, these are including the one from Clayfish, which was valid. Now, I have a, a chapter in my book, The Wandering Bishops, about what I, what I call the Apostles of Dishonor and the Catholic wannabes. Um, you can read in the book about the corruption of orders that began in the 1960s, and there were reactionary schisms from Catholic and Anglican churches that produced several new denominations. Uh, there were some of them were quite good. Uh, for example, uh, one of the more honorable ones was Bishop Adams of the Anglican Episcopal Church of North America. I met with him back in the day. Uh, he was a very fine person, but of course, would never have ordained a woman and was very conservative in his view.